Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the public lecture series organized by the Contemporary China Research Cluster, um, the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Hong Kong. And today we are very happy to have um, a very interesting presentation by um, Dr. Austin Strange, who is the Assistant Professor of International Relations uh, in the Department of Politics and Public Relations uh, at Hong Kong U. And he researches and teaches about Chinese foreign policy, international political economy, and international development. So I understand that um, today his, the title of his presentation is Banking on Beijing, the Aim and Impacts of China's Overseas Development Program. Um, I think that the title is um, the same as his recent book just published. And so without further delay, I pass the time to Dr. Strange. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Fong, for the introduction. Thank you to the Contemporary China Research Cluster for the invitation to be here. Uh, and thanks to everyone in the audience. I know this is a hectic time in the semester, so I appreciate you uh, coming out uh, and, and listening. So I'm really happy to be here today. I'm presenting um, really a, a new book that's gonna be published within the month. So I'm very excited about that. It is indeed called Banking on Beijing, the aims and impacts of China's overseas development program. And this is a collaborative project, uh, as I'll explain, I'm here on behalf of my, my collaborators, uh, Axel Dreyer, Andreas Fuchs, Brad Parks, and Mike Tierney. Um, in case you really disagree with anything I say or, or really hate anything, you, can, you should blame me. Uh, I'm only expressing my personal opinions today, but this, this is a, a collaborative project. And I wanna begin, oops, here we go. So I'd like to structure the talk by starting with a little bit of background before actually talking about the book on kind of the state of the debate on China's global development projects. Give you a little bit of context for why we decided to undertake this project uh, 10 years ago. Then I, I wanna discuss a little bit the data and the methodology that we've been developing over the past decade uh, that has allowed us to answer some uh, pretty important questions in the study uh, of China's global development projects. Then in the second part of the talk, I'll, I'll turn to the actual book and talk about the, the, the kind of the central claim that we make, which is that whereas in the 20th century, we could think of China's government as being a, a donor of foreign aid in the traditional sense, since 2000 and really in the 21st century, it makes a lot more sense to think of China not as a, an aid donor, but as a development banker. Um, and the final thing I'll talk about is why this shift is so important for developing countries. And I'll talk both about the allocation of China's aid and debt projects around the world, as well as some of the different consequences of uh, Chinese development projects for host countries and, and host societies. And I wanna begin with a point that I think uh, many, if not all of you, are probably at least somewhat familiar with, which is that this topic of China's role in global development is a really contentious subject. And in a sense, this has really been a tale of two narratives for the past 20 years. Sometimes China is, is portrayed as a villain, and other times it is portrayed as a hero uh, in the field of international development. On the one hand, we have China as being a, a, a dangerous pernicious, even harmful uh, emerging and, and rising donor in places like Africa and, and Asia. And uh, a, a 2009, very infamous article in magazine Foreign Policy in the United States labeled Chinese aid as, as rogue and basically went on to suggest that China provides foreign aid to prop up dictators and spread its ideology and extract natural resources um, and not really do things that help developing countries, but only do things that help itself. Um, and in the process of doing that, China also is undercutting the work that bilateral and multilateral creditors uh, and donors from the West, like the World Bank, the United States, other members of the OECD uh, Development Assistance Committee, China is undercutting the work uh, of these donors. More recently, um, I'm confident you're familiar with the debt trap diplomacy narrative that has emerged since uh, the BRI was launched, the Belt and Road, in 2013, 
And this narrative essentially suggests that China is almost strategically luring uh, host countries that are developing countries into uh, large, large levels of debt that China and, and China's government can then exploit for different economic and political uh, concessions, essentially. Now, a lot of these claims have been debunked in recent years, but they have staying power. And one more that we hear a negative claim about China's role in development is this idea that China's projects are not of the highest quality. China finances a lot of big ticket infrastructure projects, uh, transportation projects, lots of buildings. And a lot of these are essentially white elephant projects that aren't going to the places that need them the most and that aren't really essential economic projects from the perspective of recipient countries' development. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have a very different narrative and, and we have China being portrayed as uh, being much more efficient than traditional Western donors uh, and, and creditors, right? China, uh, China's government, China's policy banks and Chinese state-owned enterprises that finance and implement these projects do so with less bureaucratic red tape. They get things done faster and they produce real results for developing countries. China's aid is uh, less conditional than Western donor and creditor aid. There are fewer strings attached and this gives politicians and leaders and planners and host countries more room to maneuver and, and choose the projects that they want. And finally, in particular, since the launch of the Belt and Road in 2013, one of the key buzzwords we hear about China's development projects is this idea of connectivity that while Western donors have backed off of financing infrastructure in the past couple of decades, China has embraced it and it embraces this idea of connectivity and it's filling critical infrastructure gaps in different parts of Asia, different parts of Africa and elsewhere uh, in a way that no other uh, donor or creditor uh, is doing. And this contentious debate uh, about China's development finance has become somewhat of a political flashpoint. Um, one prominent example is just looking at China-US relations, where this is one of the few things that Democrats and Republicans in the United States tend to agree on these days. China's lending to developing countries is, is highly problematic from their perspective. So back in 2015, President Obama uh, accused China of funneling money into Africa in exchange for raw materials. Uh, Pence in 2018, Vice President Pence, said that China's offering infrastructure loans to governments across the world the terms of these loans are uh, opaque, the projects are unsustainable and of poor quality, and often they do come with strings attached that lead to staggering debt. And then again, we have the other side of this story, uh, or a very different narrative, which comes from places like China, obviously, but also a lot of developing countries in the world uh, and their governments, which suggests that China's offering a new option for developing countries. China's development finance is refreshing, and it allows countries to speed up their development while preserving their independence. And this, of course, is, is a veiled criticism at the conditional aid and loans that are provided by countries like the United States. So this is essentially what the discussion on China's development finance has looked like for much of the past couple of decades. There's been a lot of highly opinionated claims, but really poor empirical foundations off of which to actually evaluate these claims. A, a big part of the problem, I want to be clear about this, is that China's development finance compared to other major donors and lenders is not very transparent. So China ranks among the least transparent major donors uh, in the world. And I would argue that without a, a, a source of reliable, comprehensive, detailed data, it makes it easier for supporters of Chinese aid or for opponents of Chinese aid to be opportunistic, whether you are a government official, a media pundit, even a scholar, it's easy for you to just cherry pick one or a few cases along the Belt and Road Initiative uh, or within China's broader development finance portfolio, find some successes or find some failures and then extrapolate and make broader narratives, broader claims about the nature and the impacts of what China is doing in developing countries. And again, for a while, we haven't really had a way to evaluate these claims that are being made. Um, now, there's a long tradition of scholars trying to track uh, China's development projects, one project at a time, using a mix of uh, some limited official sources, uh, Chinese uh, party and state newspapers, for example, as well as some open sources uh, on the internet. But for a long time, and really until the past several years, we've never had comprehensive granular data on China's project level 
and development finance activities. Um, so about a decade ago, my collaborators and I decided to approach this issue in, in a very different way, which was we decided to build a new method for, for tracking China's development finance project by project using a systematic and transparent and, and a collaborative uh, approach. And the long story short is that all of the, the data and the methods are they're housed at Aid Data, which is a research lab at William and Mary. That's where I did my undergraduate degree. That's where all of this started uh, about 10 years ago. And if you're not already familiar with the data, you can access all of the data, all of the methods, um, and a lot of the underlying research that I'm going to talk about today by going to aiddata.org, and you can, you can get uh, everything there. Um, so before I fully jump in, I just want to emphasize that this has been a, a major research agenda, and as excited as I am about the book, I want to acknowledge uh, that this has really been a, a collaborative effort involving literally hundreds of people. So the data set, um, which has gone through several iterations, is now on the 2.0 version, and the methodology called tracking underreported financial flows, or TUF, has also gone through several uh, iterations. And hundreds of undergraduate and graduate students at William and Mary and at partner institutions uh, around the world in China and other Asian and African countries have helped with this, um, as have several really smart co-authors uh, who have contributed to other research with us. And I, I just list some of it here. So this has been uh, a very collaborative effort and we've been very lucky to work with uh, a lot of different individuals as well as dozens of staff members at Aid Data uh, and other universities as well. Just to give you some proof of what I'm talking about, this was me about uh, nine years ago uh, doing some initial uh, data collection work uh, in Uganda for one of the earlier pilot versions of the data set was working with a local team of enumerators to essentially print out all of the projects we had identified using open source online data collection methods and actually go door to door on the ground and investigate whether whether these data were of were of reasonable quality. And so this is one of one of the checks that we did as we were piloting the initial approach before we decided to scale it up. But this picture gives you a sense again of, of the many different diverse geographically diverse audiences who have, who have contributed uh, to, to the book. Um, so what this 10 years of work has yielded is really a first of its kind project level data set of China's official financing worldwide. So we can now go back to some of these very bold claims about the aims and impacts of, of, of China's state financing and, and assess them. And I'm not gonna get into too much of the, the methodological details here, um, you can, you can ask me about them in a, in a little bit if you'd like, or you can, you can check them out online. But essentially, again, this is an open source data collection method. Uh, it draws primarily on official sources, things like Chinese embassy websites and economic commercial counselor office uh, websites that are attached to Chinese embassies, as well as some uh, occasional reports from uh, the Ministry of Commerce and some other government uh, agencies in China. Similarly, it draws heavily on official sources on the recipient side. So host country, uh, government documents and different databases that are available to us. We also make very wide use of media reports in English and Chinese and local languages. We look at NGO reports and scholarly articles as well. And essentially what we do is triangulate between these sources and try to create high quality, unique uh, project records. And in building the data, we, we made a couple of really important interventions that are, you, you'll see why as I discuss the findings in the book, the first one is we tried to avoid one of the common limitations of earlier efforts to study China's foreign aid, um, which is to take all of the projects that China's government is financing in developing countries and lump them into one singular category called you know, foreign aid or, or development assistance. It turns out that China provides some projects that resemble aid in the traditional sense or in the way that the OECD, for example, defines foreign aid as official development assistance. But actually since 2000, the, the lion's share of what China's financed actually doesn't qualify as aid in the traditional sense. It's actually debt-based, primarily loan-based financing for big ticket infrastructure projects that uh, is not classified as aid uh, in the strict sense. It's, it's more commercially oriented financing that's not as concessional uh, as foreign aid. And then there's also a third category. So for some projects, we're just not able to identify enough information to classify them as aid or debt. So we, we uh, leave what's called their flow class uh, as, as vague. So that's one of the interventions we make. The data set that we use in the book is the 1.0 version. It's, it's a global data set and it includes 
over 4,000 projects that China's government committed uh, between a 15 year period, uh, 2000 to 2014. And this includes over $350 billion in financial commitments to 138 countries. And crucially, another intervention that we made in, in building these data was we avoided the assumption that all of the projects that were announced by China's government or in the media, we avoided assuming that these projects were all finished, right? So we follow the money from the, from the initial pledge to the commitment, uh, formal commitment, to the implementation of a project on the ground to its actual completion. And so for every project, we track the status uh, uh, of, of its development. And for the projects that reached at least the implementation phase and for which we can identify a tangible project location, we also subnationally geo-reference the locations of these projects, something like 2,500 projects. And you can see them mapped uh, here. These are all projects that reached at least the implementation phase, uh, if not the completion phase and have a physical uh, project site. Um, so we, we geo-reference these projects uh, as well. So that's a bit of background on, on kind of the broader agenda and, and the effort to provide this public good, this data set, which is all publicly available. Um, but I really wanna talk about this new book that's coming out <laughs> for the remainder of the time. And the central argument that we make in the book is that again, China has undergone a transformation in the field of global development uh, over the past two decades. So. In particular, whereas foreign aid dominated China's uh, development finance portfolio during the first uh, five decades of the PRC, since 2000, debt-based debt financing, so primarily loans from Chinese policy banks, have been the engine of China's development finance. And so just moving forward, when I, when I mentioned debt, really what I'm referring to, right, is loan-based financing from China XM Bank or China Development Bank. These are loan-based projects, a lot of them finance infrastructure. Aid projects are much more concessional. So these are things like gifts and grants and donations and things like zero interest loans that are clearly well below uh, market rates and are intended primarily for uh, recipient development. And this shift we argue in the book is, is crucial in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, the shift from donor to banker is very closely tied to changes in China's own development strategy. So this integration between China's domestic development and its approach to global development is a big part of our story that begins with the going out strategy around 1999, 2000, late 1990s. And the second part of the argument is that this shift has had really important consequences for developing countries. And the reason why is because aid projects and debt projects have completely different motivations uh, they look very different. They have different features, different scales, and they have very different effects on development outcomes uh, in, in different countries. This shift has introduced a trade-off uh, and made this trade-off really acute. On the one hand, China's big ticket infrastructure projects that are financed with debt and that increasingly dominate its development finance provide a lot of short-term efficacy. And what I mean by that is they provide a lot of short-term economic benefits. They increase economic development uh, and, and enhance it in the short term. But over time, they introduce a lot of externalities and risks that aren't really well understood by project planners. Um, and I'll talk about what those are. And so increasingly, the stakes are really high for host country governments who, on the one hand, have a lot more agency than they would have if they were working with other bilateral or multilateral donors and creditors, and they have more space to maneuver but the risks are really high because again, these projects create a lot of externalities for the economy, for the environment, for society and for politics as well, as I'll show you. So this is a, a book that covers a lot of ground and really what I'd like to do is just highlight four of the key takeaways. So I wanna begin by just documenting what this donor to banker shift has looked like over the past 20, 25 years. Then I'm gonna to shift to the allocation of China's development projects. Um, First, we'll look at how China chooses which countries to provide aid and debt to. So we'll look at cross-nationally where China's money goes. And then we'll zoom in to the sub-national level within countries and look at the kind of logic of allocation of aid and debt projects domestically uh, within, within different developing countries. And then in the final part of the talk, I'll share some of the main findings about the consequences of, 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 of doing banking with Beijing and, and how aid and in particular how debt affects development outcomes uh, for, for developing countries. So starting with this donor to banker shift, uh, what you can see here on the left side of the screen is that if we look at China's development projects, just in terms of 
the number of projects that China committed uh, around the world each year. You can see a steady increase over this 15 year period um, and kind of a, a plateauing uh, towards the end. But what you see is that aid projects, which are the darker, darker shaded ODA uh, here, these for the most part dominate China's uh, overseas development program. Towards the latter half of the period, you start to see uh, a debt-based financing, OOF, creep in a little bit more and start to represent a bigger share. But when we look at the financial value of these commitments, which is on the right-hand side, we see this shift become really pronounced around 2008, 2009, 2010 onward, where increasingly debt-based financing really starts to dominate China's development finance portfolio. And I should note now that uh, towards the end, we'll extend this time series a little bit and look at what's happened you know, in the few years since, since the study was completed. And, and it turns out that this banker, uh, sorry, this donor to banker shift is actually even more pronounced right, in, in, in the last five years uh, of the Belt and Road. But for now, what's important to remember is that this evolution that China has experienced makes it very unique among the major providers of development finance. So during this 15 year period, the first 15 years of the 21st century, China's government, according to the data that we collected, essentially approached the United States as being the largest bilateral provider of aid and loans uh, to developing countries. They were comparable in terms of their overall amount. But structurally, the composition of China's financing is, is very different than say uh, the financing provided by the US or Japan or Germany or some of these other major uh, OECD donors. Um, and what I mean by that, right, is that only about 20, 22% of China's portfolio is foreign aid in the traditional sense. About three quarters of it is actually this debt-based financing. And you can see the opposite is true for, for the US and for these other donors and creditors where the, the bulk of what they provide is actually foreign aid that qualifies as official development assistance. So this puts China in somewhat of a unique uh, situation. And as we move into the kind of empirical analysis of these projects, I want to just lay out a couple of details of our empirical approach that we use in, in all the different chapters of the book. So when we look at the, the aims and the allocation, as well as the effects of these projects, we take kind of a consistent approach throughout, throughout the entire book. One of the things we do, which I think uh, should be obvious by now, is we separate out aid versus debt projects. So we think that these probably follow a different logic in a number of different ways. And we, we run our analysis with them pooled together, but we also separate them and see whether they behave differently. And wherever possible, we also try to provide comparative context. And we benchmark our findings for China uh, with, with similar tests for the aid financing from other donors. And in particular, we do a lot of comparative analysis with the World Bank. Now, the World Bank is a really useful uh, comparative reference for us for a couple of reasons. Uh, on the one hand, the World Bank and China have very different reputations in global development. The World Bank is known for being uh, having very stringent uh, pre-project uh, evaluations and safeguards and environmental and labor and other social assessments and economic uh, cost-benefit analyses. Whereas I said earlier, China's financing is known for being much quicker, but for not having a lot of those same safeguards in place. So from a reputational standpoint, we can, we can examine whether these, these, these two different features, these two different reputations lead to different types uh, of behavior and outcomes. But given all the data we've collected on China's projects, the World Bank is also really useful because we're able to use really granular, both national and subnational data on World Bank financing throughout the world over the same period as well. So we can comprehensively test the same questions uh, for the World Bank. It, we also measure China's finance in two different ways. So we prioritize looking at, at the money and, and the financial value of China's projects, but we are missing the financial value for a good chunk of projects, maybe about a third of the projects in the database. So in some cases we use just the overall amount of projects as well. We make sure basically that the findings aren't dependent on, on either of these measures. And then for most of the chapters, we investigate the aims and impacts nationally across countries and then subnationally uh, within countries as well. So let me start off by, by speaking a little bit about the allocation of China's development projects. So where do China's projects go across countries? One of the questions we wanted to investigate, so we wanted to come back to these very contentious, uh, almost emotional debates about the pros and cons of China's aid that I mentioned at the beginning. And we wanted to test whether China really is a rogue donor as foreign policy claims that it is. And so we looked at uh, 
where China finances its aid and debt projects around the world. And in terms of China's foreign aid, geopolitics do seem to matter. So as you might uh, suspect, countries that recognize Taiwan diplomatically are, are far less likely to get foreign aid projects from China. Countries that vote more in line with China in the United Nations General Assembly, particularly on important votes, on key votes, uh, are more likely to get financing. Um, and this, if anything, makes China not necessarily a rogue donor, but uh, it makes it actually resemble the behavior of the other major donors in the international system. So there's a massive literature in the political economy of foreign aid on how bilateral donors in particular use it to pursue their foreign policy interests. So yes, China does use aid for self-interested purposes, but if anything, this basically suggests that it's taking a, a page out of the playbook of other donors. It's not doing anything all that, all that exceptional. On the other hand, we also find that China does provide a lot of foreign aid to smaller, poorer, highly underdeveloped countries who have a real economic need for it. So in the economics and the political science literature on aid allocation, this is considered a good thing, right? This is something we would hope to see. Countries with greater levels of need get more foreign aid. And so in short, we don't find much evident, uh, evidence for this rogue donor narrative. Uh, China's aid is not more likely to go to dictatorships and it's not more likely to go to countries that have more uh, natural resource reserves. Where things are a little bit more concerning is the allocation of Chinese debt projects. So these follow a commercial rather than a political or a humanitarian motive. And countries that have higher levels of stability, countries with bigger markets, bigger economies, and more corrupt countries, uh, and, and in fact, less democratic countries are more likely to get, again, big ticket, debt finance projects uh, from China's government. And there's a couple of reasons uh, why that might be the case. One of them that we discuss a lot in the book is the possibility that corruption can essentially grease the wheels of commerce and uh, make it easier for big complicated infrastructure projects to get financed in more corrupt environments with less bureaucratic oversight. And at the same time, in particular, countries in which Chinese state-owned enterprises already have a market share and a market presence. It's also this phenomenon in which uh, Chinese companies are able to collude with politicians and host countries and go to China's government and request project that then get financed in that project as well. So basically, it's easier for China's policy banks and state-owned enterprises to finance these projects in, in more corrupt countries, but also countries that have higher levels of stability uh, as well. And so here's just a summary of some of these results for the allocation. These are just uh, coefficient plots. And you can, all I want to show here is that aid and debt from China's government behave in very different ways. And that's why it's important to separate them out. And so when it comes to geopolitics, things like UN voting and recognition of Taiwan, really it's, it's China's ODA, it's China's aid projects that are driving the significant results. Whereas when we look at more kind of commercial factors you think would, would, would influence commercial decisions, recipient stability, uh, political institutions, control of, control of corruption, it, it's the debt-based financing that, that's driving, uh, driving those results. So staying on this theme of allocation, the next thing we do is move down to the domestic subnational level. And so rather than looking which countries, uh, looking at which countries get aid, we look at where, where, where the aid goes subnationally, which provinces, which states are more likely to get it. And one of the somewhat distinct features of China's approach to financing foreign aid uh, is what my co-authors call aid on demand. We call it aid a la carte in the book. Essentially China, compared to your average you know, major donor, it allows a lot more input from host country leaders and politicians in terms of requesting and identifying projects that they want. So uh, China has a long standing foreign policy principle of non-interference. And in part because of that, it allows more agency on the part of host country, again, host country leaders to choose the projects they want to brand these countries domestically as national projects and to allocate them where they want. And I think on the surface that sounds uh, okay, that sounds like a good thing. Uh, more agencies being provided to uh, leaders of actual developing countries, but there are a couple of problematic consequences here. One of them has to do with the fact that uh, politicians and host countries also are strategic actors in domestic and international politics, and their ability to uh, target and uh, request these projects makes these projects vulnerable to political manipulation domestically. And so one of the findings we have is that Chinese aid projects are more concentrated in the birth regions of leaders, particularly the effect is strongest in 
sub-Saharan Africa, where a lot of countries have a, a lot of political clientelism, where politicians use goodies like aid projects to buy votes, in particular in the lead up to competitive elections. And so this results in more aid projects ending up in provinces and states that are actually wealthier to begin with, not in the places that need it uh, the most. Part of this is about the, the, the incentives of host country politicians. The other part of this is on China's side. Again, China's financing doesn't have nearly as robust institutional safeguards to discourage this kind of behavior. And so in addition to all these statistical tests that we do, we also look at a number of case studies across the book. And in our chapter on this aid a la carte, we look at the examples of Sri Lanka and Sierra Leone as instances where China was basically was hands off and allowed the leaders of these countries to pick and locate and, and target the projects uh, as they choose. And again, when we introduce the same set of tests for the World Bank, we don't find this. So World Bank finance projects are not as vulnerable to this domestic political uh, manipulation or distortion. And within China's portfolio, it's only Chinese aid projects that are vulnerable to this. Again, even at the subnational level, the, the debt financing from China follows more of a commercial logic. So it is not as vulnerable to, uh, to, to, to host country kind of leader manipulation. And again, here you can just see a very kind of top level summary of the results where the results hold globally for Chinese aid, but they're strongest uh, for the continent of, of Africa. And again, the results don't hold for Chinese debt-based financing. This is, this is just another coefficient plot. And it's, so it's really aid to African countries that's driving uh, this result in particular. And in some follow-up tests that we run to try to get at the mechanisms behind this, what we find evidence for is that in the run-up to competitive elections, so during politically important periods, that's when this effect tends to be strongest in, in these countries. So I wanna move now to the actual impacts of these projects. And one of the challenges that we face uh, in this literature and research on the political economy of aid is that if we were to find evidence that say Chinese development finance, you know, decreases or increases growth in a developing country, our analysis might be vulnerable to all kinds of endogeneity and other types of identification challenges. So in our case, one of the things we were worried about is reverse causality, right? Where what if China's projects were going to regions that were wealthier to begin with, or were going to regions that were poorer to begin with? This could easily confound uh, our results. So our intuitive strategy to try to identify causal effects uh, of Chinese projects was to actually look back at China's economy and look at macroeconomic shifts there. And essentially, econometrically, what we do is we build a supply shock instrument that has that's the interaction of two different factors. Um, one factor, one variable captures variation over time. So we basically try to proxy for in a given year, the global availability of Chinese development finance. And we proxy this in two ways. We start with a uh, a, a, the volume of China's excess capacity, uh, things like steel and cement and iron, basically strategic commodities that China's government is known to produce in excess. And that series of Chinese policy documents basically outline the strategy in which uh, one of the ways in which excess capacity should be offloaded is through international development projects by attaching uh, conditions to uh, loans that China issues that require purchases of Chinese uh, commodities and, and Chinese materials, and by offshoring some of the production of, of, these of, of these commodities as well. The second measure is based on the same intuition. We look at years in which China has an excess of international currency reserves. And similarly here, China Exim Bank and China Development Bank actually have a mandate from China's government to offload excess foreign currency reserves for global development projects to try to earn a better return uh, on those reserves than just keeping them all in things like US Treasury bonds. And so either of these proxies basically capture overall kind of global variation uh, across time, across each year. And we interact that with a variable that captures variation across space. And basically we're trying to get at different levels of exposure to Chinese development finance. So we have a measure which is the probability of receiving aid for a given country or for a given subnational region. And all that is, is just the percentage of years in our analysis in which a country got at least one project from China. And as a secondary measure, we use a historical uh, measure of this where we look at from 1970 to 1999, the percentage of years in which a country got uh, a project from China. And so the intuition here is that years in which China has more excess capacity to offload, whether it's currency reserves or it is these different commodities and materials, 
there's going to be uneven effects of that excess that are felt around the world. Regions that have higher levels of exposure historically to China's development finance are going to feel that positive shock more than low exposure regions. And so this is somewhat akin to a difference in differences set up where we're trying to exploit differential effect of China's project inputs on, on financing to different places that are high and low exposure to, to China's development finance. And we, we run a, 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 a long set of tests in the book that I'm not gonna uh, cover exhaustively here, but I just wanna highlight some of the key findings that we, that we arrive at using this identification strategy. So I wanna talk about this trade-off between efficacy and, and, and safety. And starting with efficacy, we find really strong, robust evidence that China's development projects, uh, aid projects, and especially, again, large-scale, big-ticket, debt-based financing, which is mostly in infrastructure, these projects increase short-term economic growth uh, in developing countries. We don't find any evidence that China's projects in the short term perform worse than the World Bank. Um, we find positive effects there too, but if anything, the effects are stronger for China's financing. And we also look at some other development outcomes as well beyond just economic development. And I should also note, we look at economic development at the national level looking at changes in, in GDP and GDP per capita, but subnationally we look at changes in um, nighttime lights volume using, using satellite data. But we also look at health outcomes. We look at population health, things like infant mortality, um, and we find positive effects there as well. And we look at spatial inequality. And one of the key findings is that China's transportation infrastructure projects in particular, so some of the you know uh, most famous or infamous Belt and Road projects, these railways and highways and, and, and ports, these types of projects tend to lower spatial inequality subnationally uh, within countries. And I'll give you an example of, of, of what we find. So this is a highway that uh, China's government financed uh, between Nairobi and Thika in Kenya. And what you see on the map here is changes in nighttime lights density uh, over the six year period, 2008 to 2013. And essentially what we find in a lot of cases is that when a transportation corridor like this highway is constructed, economic activity spreads away from cities like Nairobi and it spreads to satellite towns that are located along the corridor. So basically economic activity becomes more spread out than it was previously. So that's a bit on the efficacy side. We find pretty convincing evidence that there are real short-term gains that are both economically and maybe politically attractive from the perspective of host governments. But there are safety risks as well. Um, and what I'm talking about here are different externalities that Chinese development finance introduces, in particular, large scale uh, debt finance, infrastructure and other projects. What we find here is that these projects, and, and remember one of the things I mentioned earlier is that these projects go to more corrupt environments to begin with, they tend to in exacerbate corruption in these countries. Um, they also increase the likelihood of civil conflict. And, one of the, we, we don't systematically test this in the book, but a couple of possibilities here. One of them is that uh, transportation and other types of infrastructure basically extend kind of the access and the capacity of the state and allow them to potentially confront rebel or opposition groups in other parts of the country. Another possibility is that these large complicated infrastructure projects create short-term externalities as well, and they create grievances that lead to civil unrest in some cases. Um, Aid projects do not increase corruption or civil conflict, at least according to our tests. We find a really important role uh, for host governments. This is what I meant by, by raising the stakes. So in a number of different scenarios, host governments can modulate and, and mitigate some of the potentially negative effects um, and some of the risks of these projects. One example we look at, which is a bit different, is we look at uh, deforestation that's caused by China's infrastructure and other projects. And we find that the outcomes on deforestation, so deforestation is much worse in countries that have weak environmental regulatory uh, laws and regimes than, than, uh, than do host countries with stronger regimes. Um, we don't find any evidence that Chinese aid undermines the effectiveness of Western aid. So this is coming back to one of those earlier claims about China being a rogue donor. We really don't find uh, any, any evidence for that. So I wanna uh, kind of summarize and synthesize this a little bit when it comes to the consequences of banking on Beijing, we find much more of a mixed bag, which is more in the middle of that initial spectrum uh, that, that I mentioned between China being 
a villain or a hero. We, we don't think China is either of those things. Um, on the one hand, there are some real reasons for optimism. So China provides, China is a major foreign aid donor. It provides a lot of aid to countries in need. And in the short term, China's debt financing also has some things to be enthusiastic about. It increases economic growth. It tends to do that primarily through stimulating uh, investment and to a lesser extent consumption. It reduces infant mortality, lowers spatial inequality, uh, at least in the short term. There are also reasons for concern. And there are these risks that I've been mentioning. So on the allocation side, more aid uh, tends to be politically manipulated domestically and go to strategically kind of politically important regions like birth regions in African countries. And we don't find this for the World Bank. And debt projects, as I mentioned a couple of times, are, if anything, are, are more roguish than China's aid projects. They tend to go to uh, more corrupt, less democratic countries and, and tend to exacerbate pre-existing uh, problems in, in those countries. So the key takeaways of the book, just to reiterate here, China, just in terms of the sheer volume of its uh, aid, in particular of its debt-based financing since 2000, and I'll show you what I mean in just a minute, has raised the stakes for developing country governments who have choices over whether and which kind of projects they want to request from China's government. Overall, this has led to a big increase in big ticket infrastructure, which is really at the heart of the efficacy versus safety trade-off. And so, again, these projects, in particular debt-based financing, have short-term improvements uh, in, in economic and other outcomes, but they create debt, uh, political, environmental, and other risks over time as well that aren't particularly well understood. Um, the final point I would make is that Again, most of the analysis we do in the book stops around 2014 or 2015, but what we've witnessed in the past six or seven years, basically almost the first decade of the Belt and Road Initiative, is this donor to banker shift becoming even more acute uh, in recent years. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a graph just to illustrate that in a minute. But essentially when the Belt and Road Initiative was announced in late 2013, I had already been working on studying China's development finance for a couple of years. And on the one hand, I think a lot of us recognize that this was a really important new foreign policy initiative, a signature foreign policy initiative of the Xi Jinping era. But a lot of the underlying rationale for the Belt and Road looked very familiar because a lot of the same national economic priorities that underpin Belt and Road era infrastructure financing were also some of the key drivers for the going out strategy, you know, 15 years earlier. These are things like China's political leaders anticipating gradually slowing growth at home, wanting to uh, offload excess foreign exchange reserves and excess capacity of domestically produced production materials, as we discussed. This drive to internationalize state-owned enterprises, particularly in key sectors, and make them competitive. Um, and to acquire a higher level of, of energy security, energy and, and natural resource security. And so as much as the BRI might be about things like soft power or public diplomacy and political influence, the economic rationale is not necessarily all that different, at least in my estimate. And really what this boils down to, which makes China a little bit different or, or quite very different from a lot of the other major donors and creditors is that there's this very strong integration between China's domestic development and its international development. And so if you look at the updated data set that we released uh, late last year, which goes through 2017 instead of 2014, it turns out that a lot of the lessons that we kind of arrive at in this book are even more relevant today because this transition from donor to banker has continued and even strengthened in recent years where debt-based financing has really come to dominate uh, development finance from China's government. The last thing I'll say is that if anyone is interested in these data and if you're not already familiar with them, just to reiterate, uh, all of this is available online. And so what I've talked about so far is really just the tip of the iceberg, both in terms of what types of data are available, the level of detail, um, as well as uh, what's in the book. And so if any of this is interesting to you, It'll be available in less than a month. Uh, it's coming out with Cambridge University Press. You can pre-order it uh, already, and, and I encourage everyone to uh, engage with it. And um, with that, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Well, thank you so much, Austin. This very, very interesting presentation, I guess, um, help us to understand a lot, um, you know, what the media has been discussed about the um, 
um, the, the the foreign um, um, you know um, investment of the, of Beijing, and I think that is really a good um, a showcase of how um, important are the the scientific hardcore data for helping us to really to understand what is going on. I'm sure that um, a lot of our um, uh, audience will have questions, and so now uh, we have the time for Q and A. So either you can unmute yourself and also. Uh, if you can also um, show um, you know, um, uh, yourself to, to us, or you can just write down your question on the chat box, and, and um, I'm sure that Austin will um, answer the questions. Okay, David, and then uh, Jin Nan. Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I'll really look forward to the book. Uh, it's really great to have this uh, really evidence-based and objective analysis of uh, all of the you know, growing uh, Chinese um, aid and, and debt uh, projects uh, overseas. So I just had one question, which is basically that um, uh, it seems that you're kind of comparing uh, China's um, uh, 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 aid development and debt um, programs with other countries. And um, one kind of, uh, in some of the discourses and debates that I've been noticing, one of the comparisons that's often made is, it's not really comparing China to other countries, but it's rather China to the, the kind of the um, IMF and World Bank uh, kind of model. So there's one model, which is the Chinese model of this kind of debt financing and IMF World Bank is another one. And you know, there's one voice that says that, well, basically all the IMF and so on, they just do structural adjustment. And that so at the end of the day, after all these decades, there's nothing, no infrastructure, nothing is really being built in these countries, whereas China is actually building things. Is this, I mean, what do you make of this, uh, of this uh, kind of comment? And how do you compare the Chinese model to that, those kind of multilateral uh, Western kind of focus or Western controlled um, uh, inst instruments for uh, aid and uh, loans. Eric, should I do one question at a time or should we take a few here? Mm, well, up to you. Do you uh, want to take a few or you want to answer uh, one by one? I wasn't sure what, what the protocol is. I'm happy to take a few if that's okay. Okay, and, yeah, that would be answer fine. them in a group. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we can ask uh, Jin Nang and also okay. Ben. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Eric, sorry. Uh, congratulations, Austin. Uh, this is really a wonderful project and book. Uh, and uh, so my question is, I wonder, uh, I know that your research is mainly focusing on uh, China's um, aid in Africa, but I wonder throughout the research, you notice how much the Chinese government uh, is aware about the problems that you just now analyzed, such as the lack of institutional safeguards of uh, those aid and deaths and also the this and even distribution of the aid among the wealthy and the poor uh, in Africa. And uh, I wonder, uh, uh, does the Chinese government have uh, some intention to fix those problems um, in the future um, aid in Africa? Yeah. Uh, and now actually no, not only Africa. <laughs> yeah, uh, those are, yeah, outflow, yeah. Okay, thank you. And Ben? Yeah, hi. Uh, Austin, thanks so much. Re really great, really, really interesting presentation and, and, and superb work. Uh, super, super exciting project. Um, I have a million questions for you. I'm going to limit them to a couple, of, I think, relatively simple ones. So uh, looking at your graphs, it seemed to me, I could be wrong about this, that the proportion of what, what you've labeled uh, vague um, finance is also increasing. Is that is that true? Uh, and if so, kind of what, what the proportions of that are overall anyway in, in recent years. Um, you also made a distinction between the type of finance, uh, let's see, as I had it anyway, it was, it was that OOF uh, disproportionately goes to countries labeled corrupt in this analysis, right, or higher degrees of corruption. I wondered, is that also the case for ODA, or is that simply the case for OOF? It seems like like in the in the narrative that you've that you've given us, uh, like the ODA disproportionately goes to places 
uh, like the birthplaces of leaders, for instance, that would seem to be its own indicator of corruption. Right? And so I kind of I wondered if there was a similar kind of relationship uh, between ODA and and corruption, as as you mentioned, between OOF and corruption. I guess those are my two my two big questions. Thanks so much. I can I can go ahead and take this uh, batch first. I'll just go in order. Uh, first of all, hi, hi David, and thanks for your question. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot myself recently, so I'm glad that you you asked about this. Um, and I'll just make I guess make one comment, which is maybe an indirect answer to your question, but I think interesting nonetheless. Um, when it comes to comparing whether it's the aims and impacts or just the behavior of what China's government has been doing with its development finance, uh, I think you're right. I, I think what you're getting at here is right where there is um, a bit of a challenge here because in terms of bilateral donors and creditors, there simply isn't anyone else doing uh, what China's doing in terms of the, the volume of its infrastructure financing, nor is there now uh, multilaterally. China is clearly the world's largest provider of, again, kind of big ticket infrastructure, uh, what we call the hardware of development. And so the World Bank in the book is a useful comparison for us because the World Bank does provide uh, both aid and debt. And so unlike the, you know, the graph I showed showed how the United States and Japan provide mostly foreign aid, the World Bank has the IDA, which is highly concessional financing to very low income countries. And then the IBRD, which is more um, kind of more loan based, less concessional financing. So it's a good comparison for looking at what we call flow class aid versus debt. But we don't have a great comparison for Chinese infrastructure. And I think this is a really important point because there's obviously been a whole lot of backlash towards a lot of Belt and Road infrastructure projects in, in the first decade of the BRI. And uh, I, I just wrote actually a, a draft for a, a policy piece about this that I'll, I'll be publishing myself, which basically argues that we actually need to avoid conflation here. And what I mean by that is some of the criticism and some of the problems that come out of these BRI infrastructure projects are probably uh, related to and maybe even a product of some of these uh, features of China's development finance. It's deference to host country leaders, uh, the way in which it's allocated, some of the things I talked about in the talk. There are some features of China's development finance that are problematic in that regard. Um, on the other hand, if you just look historically at earlier periods of global development after World War II, when the IBRD and the United States were financing infrastructure around the world, one of the reasons why Western countries stopped doing this is because infrastructure projects by nature are inherently complicated and prone to being over budget and being delayed and, and, and being costly. So part of this is about unique features of China's infrastructure. Part of it, I think, is just about infrastructure. And we don't, from a kind of global uh, large N angle, we don't have a great way to get at that. But I think um, we have to keep that in mind as well. Um, and Zhang Nan, thank you for your question as well. Um, I'm a bit more speculative in my answer on this one um, because for a while, uh, in particular when I was more plugged in with, with, with aid data, which is at William & Mary where I did my degree, we were actually uh, talking with, with different parts of China's government for a while about even maybe working together on something, trying to, trying to uh, help with the data transparency issue. That uh, went away essentially. And my reading is that uh, even to the present day, there are parts of the Chinese government who need to have good information on China's development finance that don't have it and actually use, for example, the aid data data set or some of the other data sets that have been out there. And here we are in 2022 and anecdotal evidence that I have suggests that that's still going on. I think that's a little bit different from your question, which is more about aware of some of these problems and these byproducts. And, and I think the answer is yes, they, they're, they're definitely aware, but two quick things. One, the economic and political rationale for these for these for these different development projects. Personally, I think it's strong enough that uh, it is going. To, these projects are going to be tenacious. And some of my other work actually looks at the fact that China has actually been financing large scale, high profile infrastructure all the way back to the 1960s through very diverse eras in Chinese politics. And it's been criticized over and over again, but it's been tenacious. So I think part of this is about trying to recognize problems and improve them, but the political and economic incentives uh, are still there. The, the only other thing I would mention is that there are a number of other actors who are not part of uh, this book project, but that also matter. So domestic and international NGOs 
I have some work that looks at the role of, of kind of not quasi and non-state Chinese actors and being channels for trying to learn and uh, diffuse some of this, you know, international best practice type of information back to the to, to China's government. This has gotten more difficult to do since 2017 with the new foreign NGO law, but there are still some some channels of that uh, happening. And then, uh, Ben, thanks for your questions as well. Um, in terms of the vague financing, the long story short here is that um, we have a hunch that a lot of these projects are probably uh, debt-based financing, but the reason why we don't wanna categorize them as such is because to make the distinction between aid and debt, you have to be able to calculate something called the grant element, which is basically a project's level of concessionality. It has to uh, reach this threshold of 25% or above to be called foreign aid or to be considered ODA. And we just don't have the, for example, the specific um, you know, maturity date and grace period, these different terms of loans that allow us to do that. Um, I should note though, that the latest version of the data, the 2.0 version actually has a lot more data on loan terms. And so the percentage of vague projects is actually going down if we look you know, to the most recent data. Um, and then your point about corruption and ODA, uh, that's a good observation. <laughs> I think this is why we use both national and subnational analysis essentially where to pick up on um, the link to corruption in terms of China's aid, uh, you actually need to look subnationally where it does not show up at the national level. Yeah. Great. And um, we have three questions in the chat box and also Karen raised her hand. So maybe we go um, through the questions in, in the chat box first and then Karen can ask your question. So here, the first question is that, um, my question is how about the research on China's foreign aid by Chinese scholar? How is the interaction with your peers in China regarding your research on China's foreign aid? The second question is, um, is a question about your data collection and the method, uh, which um, would like you to um, elaborate further. And then the third question is that I wonder if China also suffer from the risk to invest in poor and corrupt countries where governance is poor. For example, a number of countries, example, Sri Lanka and Nigeria, request to negotiate with China. Do you expect China may change its loan strategy? And then Karen. Yes. Um, hi, Austin. Nice to see you. Um, a, a couple of questions. Uh, so first, you didn't get into it much in the in the talk, but I wonder to what extent do you look at cross sectors or looking sort of that way in terms of what seems to be the changing priorities uh, by the Chinese government for its um, for its aid um, or its development finance, I should say. And then secondly, um, you know, obviously a lot of focus right now in terms of the pandemic. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts or speculations as to how. Um, what the next chapter of this book might look like um, post, uh, post pandemic and, and what you think, uh, if any changes there might be to the way in which development finance uh, is flowing. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'll try to go in, in order here again and see if I, can, if I can capture everything. So I think uh, Ken was first. And this is a question about uh, Chinese scholars reactions. This is an interesting question, uh, a few quick comments. So in general, uh, so I, I read Chinese sources. I have learned a lot from the writings of Chinese scholars on China's foreign aid system over the years. Um, a lot of the research in China, and I'm really generalizing here, but for a while, there's a pretty strong qualitative tradition and um, study of foreign aid. Uh, in, in, for example, in a lot of journals that publish articles on Chinese aid. Um, and a lot of the most famous, most influential aid scholars in China on China's aid are, are qualitative scholars. Um, uh, I think one of the really valuable things about their work, in addition to the fact that they're really smart, is that they have really good access to China's government, at least relative to a lot of us. So this black box of, of kind of the, the, um, the sometimes serpentine bureaucracy of Chinese aid, they have a stronger, you know, more accurate per, uh, perception, I think, than we do. But I can't speak for them. My general perception is that, um, so I, when I was actually able to travel to mainland China years ago, um, I, I would say the, the reception was heterogeneous. There was some skepticism about a U.S. research lab collecting all this data on China's aid. There were also a lot of young scholars who were really excited to use it. And as I said, there were even members of China's government and different ministries who 
hosted us and who wanted to have a uh, even a collaboration, although that, that didn't end up happening. So pretty heterogeneous. Um, but I honestly have to profess, I don't have my finger on the pulse these days because it's very hard to travel to mainland China right now. So I need to get back and, and see, just to be completely honest. Um, uh, Angel, about your question and triangulation. Yeah, thanks for asking about this. Um, I'll just be brief since I want to get to as many questions as I can. Um, I, so I won't dig into all the details that are online, but in terms of how does the triangulation work, um, if you look at the TUF 2.0 methodology, there are a couple of tools we use to try to be transparent about how we prioritize sources, for example. So in general, we prioritize things like official sources over more speculative sources, but every project in the data set has what's called a health of record score, where we assess it at the quality of the information that went into building the record based on the type of information we have, the types of sources that we have, the combination of sources that we have, so on uh, and so forth. Um, so I would just say, I would refer you to the methodology if you're more interested. Um, and Debbie, I'm gonna come back to your question. I haven't had a chance to process it uh, just yet. So I'm gonna skip ahead and, and, and come back and, and go to Karen. And, and Karen, great to see you as well. Thanks, thanks for the questions. In terms of China's ODA, I had personally, we could parse through the data and see, I personally have not picked up on major changes in sectoral priorities. So one thing, glad you raised this, because one thing I want to emphasize is that even though the book is all about China's transition to a development banker, it doesn't mean that China is not a donor anymore. It means that it's primarily a banker. But China is still one of the top five, top 10, maybe fifth or sixth biggest bilateral aid donors uh, in the world, if we, if we go by these data. And if you look uh, all the way back to earlier periods of Chinese aid giving, um, all the way through you know, early reform era, all the way up until the current period, China has provided foreign aid to a very, dive, you know, all different sectors, right? Health, agriculture, it's sent health teams since the 1950s and 60s. Um, I know Karen has done work on, on, on the health aid, but the sectoral distribution, I believe, remains pretty much in place and, and, and pretty balanced and, and diverse. And that's something that is often not really appreciated and gets lost in some of these bigger narratives. In terms of the next chapter, so uh, I don't have a lot of profound thoughts on what the pandemic means for this. I'd be interested to hear what you think later. We do have, so the final chapter of the book is actually this thought experiment where we project the Belt and Road Initiative until 2025. And we consider a few different scenarios. One of them is in which China decides to multilateralize and increase its cooperation with, uh, with, with kind of incumbent Western donors and creditors um, and become more transparent. And we're not terribly optimistic that this will happen, but we go through what that might look like. We look at the opposite end of the spectrum where China might just continue going it alone and what that might mean. And then kind of a middle of the road scenario where we have incremental gains in terms of coordination between donors, but, but not too many. Um, and I think just so I can get to Debbie's question as well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move to, to Debbie's. So Debbie asks, if China also suffers from the risks to invest in poor and corrupt countries, right? Yes, okay, I see. So I think this is a really good question and, and actually something I wanted to comment on, but I, but I forgot to, which is it's important to keep in mind um, that our study period in the book is 15 years. And this is related to the point I, that I responded uh, to, to David's question with, which is that if we wanna understand whether comparatively or not, the impacts, the full impacts of China's infrastructure projects in particular, we actually need, need more time to pass, right? So yes, there are short-term gains and kind of medium-term externalities and costs and risks. However, and this is the same, I think, if you look domestically at infrastructure in China, there are really uh, unresolved debates about the economic long-term merits of some of these infrastructure projects. And I don't think uh, neither us as the authors of this book or really anyone has a, a great grasp uh, on these. And so in terms of whether China will change its strategy, um, yes, the risks are real, but I do think that China's uh, state-backed and, and somewhat long horizon approach to financing this capital does make it potentially more resilient to these medium-term externalities. And someone who has worked a lot on this is actually Stephen Kaplan, who's done some work on China's loans in Latin America. And he talks about this, this idea of patient capital, the fact that yes, there are a lot of uh, ex economic and other externalities in the medium term, but this is a type of kind of patient long-term capital that only China is providing right now. So if developing country leaders want this kind of capital, they're gonna to continue to demand it. And given that it syncs up well with some of China's macroeconomic objectives, 
if anything, I would say that, yes, maybe they'll, they'll try to learn and minimize uh, things like corruption and risks, or at least reduce them. But this general synergy between the economic and political incentives of China's government and of host country governments, I think is gonna stay in place um, for, for the foreseeable future. Great. And um, so we have another question in the chat box. So the question is, have you looked at the shift from policy to commercial banks as a function of debt capacity? My understanding is policy banks increased loans quite substantially post 2010 stimulus in part for domestic purposes and may have become reluctant to increase loans further. Yeah, hi, Andrew. Nice to uh, be with you as well. So I have not looked at this specific question in terms of the uh, kind of shares of policy versus commercial banks, just to be completely transparent. One thing that's worth noting, though, is that even just looking at policy banks, um, again, if we look at the updated version of the data set, we find that a, a group, the share of China's policy bank loans that are collateralized has increased. It's actually doubled. Um, in recent years, something like uh, it's gone from 30% to 60% of Chinese policy bank loans that are in, in this data set to developing countries that have some form of, of kind of default insurance, whether it's collateral or something else. And so even within policy banks themselves, after 2010, really kind of after 2013, 2014, you see a strong increase in, um, in their kind of use of uh, these types of, of, of collateralization and other types of insurance tools to um, to protect these investments as well. But but I'm not sure about the shift from policy to commercial banks. Hey, any other questions? So Austin, I have a question. So um, the way you do your analysis is like, um, you know, China um, put in some money um, for project um, in a particular um, place. But um, would it be a possibility there is a, a reverse or interaction relationship? That means I put my project there in my first project and got very good um, return. And then people are over there very much receptive. I got more influence there. And then I will you know, put more money there um, and invest more projects. Initially, we thought that um, more of that might be going on. So one of the um, other tests that we ran was this idea of kind of co-location where, right, maybe it's a big infrastructure project, maybe it's just some other development project. And that uh, might, you know, might set off a couple of different processes on the ground, right? It might allow a Chinese state-owned enterprise to get a foothold in a local market and maybe do more business there in the future, might allow banks to understand the risk environment there, so on and so forth. In the short term, at least, you know, in this somewhat narrow period, we didn't find a, a too much evidence of that. Um, but for what it's worth, one thing that we, we didn't really look at just because it wasn't quite in the purview of, our, of, our, of the questions we were asking um, was to look at whether or not Chinese development projects stimulated other kinds of economic engagements with China, like foreign direct investment uh, or, or, or trade. We do, in, in a lot of the tests, we, we control for China's foreign direct investment and make sure that it's, it's not what's driving the results rather, rather than the aid projects. Um, there is a bit of work on this though that I could refer you to by a couple of my colleagues at Fudan University, uh, Zhong Yu and Pippa Morgan, who actually look at historical Chinese financing to Africa from the 1950s up until you know, 2010. And they find that historically China's aid projects help Chinese uh, uh, government and non-government actors essentially develop social networks in these countries and that leads to greater Chinese investment uh, but it's not something that we looked at. Thank you. Any other question from our audience? Okay so it seems that we have already spent more than half an hour now discussion. And I'm sure that some of us may would like to contact you in person or directly send you email uh, later. But once again, thank you so much, um, Austin, for your really wonderful presentation. Learn a lot from it. And hopefully that now you are staying at the Greater Bay Area, you can um, shift your research focus more on the Greater Bay Area and to find out the 
um, the, the investment from Hong Kong to the Greater Bay Area or vice versa, and to look at the impact. Um, so once again, thank you very much. And also I would like to, uh, once again, to mention about the title of your book, Banking on Beijing, the Aims and Impact of China Overseas Development Program. If you want to, if any one of us would like to know more about um, the, um, the presentation, the, uh, the arguments and, 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 the, and the data, I strongly encourage you to purchase the book. As um, Austin has mentioned that um, the book, I think is now available uh, on Amazon. Um, and anyhow, so I also would like to draw everyone your attention is that um, the Contemporary China Research Cluster is going to launch a new lecture series on Greater Bay Area. And the first um, lecture um, will, be, uh, will be held on May 26 um, by Professor um, um, sorry, uh, from, from University of British Columbia and um, a Fu Chang, Professor Fu Chang from University of British Columbia. And the title of his presentation is The Road to Serfdom or Freedom, Urban Governance, Civic Engagement and Contentious Politics in Guangdong. So we want to uh, have this particular lecture series focusing on the Greater Bay Area. I think just like the spirit of what um, Austin um, research is, we want to base on the, um, the data and um, to uh, explore different issues uh, in this region. So once again, thank you very much, Austin. And also thank you for all our audience uh, to participate in um, this wonderful um, lecture and hope to see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Nice to see everyone.